All right. So I got 301. So I'm going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time uh, because we do have quite a bit of stuff to get through today. So uh, again, thank you everybody for coming and welcome to the February meeting of the DuPage Ross Council. Uh, my name is Jared Burton. I am the DuPage Ross coordinator. And uh, importantly, I'm also a person in long-term recovery from substance use. Uh, so thanks to everybody who made it out today. Another great turnout. Um, just some housekeeping stuff to start off. Uh, if we could make sure that everybody's microphones are muted, unless you're talking, uh, that would be helpful. Um, and then also just an FYI that uh, we are recording this meeting um, as per usual. And we put those meetings up on our YouTube page. So if anybody ever misses it, I usually include the links uh, in follow-up emails throughout the week. Um, I would like to ask if everybody could please put their name and organization, if applicable, in the chat, because uh, that's sort of our way of taking attendance at these meetings. Uh, and it's also just a great way for folks to connect. Um, we've had a really good amount of success with referrals and handoffs and uh, new access to services, kind of like through the connections that we've made at these meetings. Um, and actually in just a couple minutes here, I'm gonna have my co-coordinator Danny talk about the WhatsApp group that we've kind of migrated that over to. Uh, so we'll get to him here in a second, but go ahead and put your name and info in the chat so that way we can kind of share um, and connect uh, through this stuff. Uh, so again, we do have a lot of stuff to get through today. So I'm gonna take a look at the agenda. Let me share my screen real quick. All right, give me a thumbs up if you can see. All right, thumbs up. All right, so um, let's talk about what we're gonna get through today. Um, not really gonna go over the previous meeting minutes. Last month, we did have a presentation from the Illinois uh, Helpline for Opioids and Other Substances, uh, which was actually very helpful. Um, afterwards, we ended up kind of making some connections that will probably bear fruit in some other programs that are coming up uh, in DuPage County in the coming year. So again, if you miss any of those meetings, they are up on the YouTube page. If you just search DuPage Rosk on the YouTube, you should be able to find it. So not only are our Ross Council meetings there, but any other types of presentations and things we record, uh, including our um, DuPage Ross presentation series, which we do once a month. So all those are up there if you're interested. Um, let's talk about some meetings that are coming up though, because we do have some here coming up in the next couple months I wanna let everybody know about. First off, so we have the DuPage Ross Council subcommittee. So this is a way that we kind of, um, are able to focus on maybe some of the uh, bigger picture things that we're doing in the Ross, some of the uh, collaborations, and then maybe just to hear some ideas from people on, you know, what do you want to see this Ross accomplish? What are some of the things maybe we're overlooking and what are some ways we can collaborate with people? Um, so up until this point, um, exactly, exactly. our committee meeting has been um, in person. However, we've kind of found, and I have did some polling for this, uh, that people might have a better chance of attending if we did make uh, some portion of it virtual. Um, so I think we're gonna try that for this one coming up. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, the meetings mm -hmm. are, the committee meetings are at 7 p.m. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I understand what it's like. You work, you know, a long day. I'm gonna mute whoever that is real quick. All right, uh, you work a long day, you come home. Sometimes the last thing you wanna do is turn back around and go to a meeting. So I totally understand. So uh, Wednesday, February 22nd uh, at 7 p.m., we're gonna try that committee meeting. There's quite a bit of projects that we're working on. And I'm gonna to touch on those uh, kind of towards the end of the meeting when we do organizational updates, but we are gonna need some help uh, with quite a few things. So um, those of you who made him made it to last month's committee meeting or previous one. I, I gave a little bit of a preview, but now I can announce uh, some of those things that we're doing. So we'd love to have you come out, even if it's virtually, uh, and I'll make sure that this flyer is making the rounds uh, in my follow-up notes. Um, I do wanna talk about next month's meeting, uh, which is our Ross Council meeting. Wednesday, March 8th, we are having a presentation uh, and it still says February, forget that, right here's the date, uh, that we're getting a presentation from Naomi's house uh, on human trafficking. So they're a, a phenomenal organization out here that uh, does great work with uh, exploited women, trafficked women. And I think that that's often a kind of intersection with substance use and mental health that we don't talk about enough. So they're going to come out and give us a presentation on that. And I'm really, really excited about that one. So the um, Zoom ID and passcode that you got in with today, that's just gonna stay the same. So if you ever you know, don't see a flyer, aren't sure what's going on, just save that. And so that way, you know, um, second Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m., you can pop on that and, and that's where we will be. So make it out for that one. 
Also, we are still doing our sock drive. Now, I want to talk about the sock drive for a second because the amount of socks we've gotten so far is just amazing. So the sock drive is uh, collecting new and unworn socks for donation to the People's Resource Center uh, in Wheaton and then also in Westmont where the uh, food pantry is. Um, the drive we did last month was for winter coats and we were uh, fortunate enough through all the donations that we took to donate around 10 full bags of winter coats to the People's Resource Center. Uh, this time we decided to do socks, right? And as it says right there in the flyer, you know, something like socks is something that we often really take for granted uh, for those folks who maybe have lived outdoors, unhoused, uh, or kind of struggling and still out there. You know, just a pair of clean socks is a very valuable commodity. Um, and so this was a priority for us as soon as we heard that they would uh, take some socks, we were all over it. And uh, right now, just in my basement, we have three full plastic crate bins of socks, um, not only for people who, you know, have donated through the Rosk and through Serenity House, uh, but also this past month, um, Mark Matthews, who comes to these meetings pretty often, uh, was helping organize a sober skate event. Uh, so a sober roller skating event, which he had like around 150 plus people show up to that. And he also used that as a way to take donations for us for the socks. So we really appreciate them doing that. Uh, we're going to keep taking them for about another week. So we're going to hopefully drop them off PRC um, next week. And so if you would like to donate, you can always take them to Serenity House, 891 South Rawling in Addison, or you can just email me or if you have my phone number, you can reach out and we can make some kind of arrangements. But we're, we're really looking to do this as a, as a monthly thing just because of the success of what we had so far. Uh, we're always looking for community partners uh, to partner up with for these donations. So if you are one of those organizations and you have some needs, please let us know. Uh, because I think that's some way that we can collaborate and Ross can really make a difference in collecting these things for different organizations. So feel free to reach out. Uh, we're very, we're very open to that. All right, I do want to turn it over to my colleague Danny Sorbus for a minute because I did mention earlier that um, WhatsApp group. So the, the impetus for this was we had started last year a uh, group chat which was basically just for us to kind of connect not only professionally, but personally as people who kind of work with recovery in DuPage County, the amount of referrals we were getting, um, not only through our organizations, but also just personally of, you know, people who were looking for uh, residential treatment, people who were looking for outpatient, people who were looking for a detox, uh, people who were uninsured but needed services. We were getting all of these requests and sometimes we felt like some of these people were maybe falling through the cracks, right? So as we started the ROSC, we realized there's so many people that are connected to these organizations. Uh, there's, there's really gotta be a better way that we can kind of set up and, and handle some of these referrals. And so we started a group chat last year uh, that grew to about 18 or 19 people. Um, since it started, I mean, dozens of people we've been able to find services for. It's been it's been really, really successful. But now it's at a point where it's kind of growing unwieldy as far as a text-based system goes. So we migrated over to uh, WhatsApp. So I'm going to have Danny talk about that for just a minute. And then he'll also kind of walk you through. Uh, if you're interested in, in uh, joining uh, with it, we can walk you through that part too. So Danny, go right ahead. Thank you, Jared, and good afternoon, everyone. So we launched the Rosh referral team um, subgroup last Wednesday, February 1st. So it's been going for exactly one week. We already have 20 group participants from different organizations, such as sober living resources, private practices, hospitals, substance use disorder, mental health treatment centers, and probation and court services that, thus far. In just a week, we've already helped provide referrals to individuals seeking things like anger management resources, sober living, emergency housing, group homes that take Medicaid with nursing services, lawyer assistance, and medical assisted recovery. So we've been doing a lot of good work already. Um, if anyone's interested, um, I'm going to put my email information again in the chat. So please feel free to email me um, if you're interested in joining or just put your information here in the chat and I'll get back to you. Um, I want to thank everyone who's joined and participated thus far, as well as those who are showing interest in joining. And we look forward to continue filling the gaps and assisting our clients getting the services they need. So basically, in terms of what's needed to happen, Jared has on the screen right there. 
Um, we made it tech proof. If anyone's bad at tech, we, we, we will walk you through the process. Exactly. So we have a form right there that we're going to send out a document that walks you through how to download WhatsApp Messenger. And once you have downloaded WhatsApp Messenger, I will send a, a email a link for you to join our specific group. But then again, you'll have my information too if you need to call or email for further assistance. All right. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, really looking forward to having more people on there. Also, when we have kind of like a system like WhatsApp, we can kind of create subgroups too for like even more specific types of needs. So we're looking forward to see how that grows here uh, in the next year as we get that up and going. Um, all right. So I think I've got a lot of the housekeeping stuff out of the way. I'm going to stop my share for a minute. So with all the housekeeping stuff out of the way, I do want to kind of get some time here to get our uh, guests, our guest presenters up. Um, and there might be a weird kind of awkward fumble as I pass this to them, but we'll get through that in a second. Um, so there's currently a number of uh, legislations that are being worked on in the state of Illinois, uh, which are you know directly related to substance use and mental health disorders. Uh, and there's different advocacy groups that are really making great strides in uh, making sure the people of Illinois uh, have proper care and access to resources. Um, and today's guests are definitely doing that. Um, so I do want to bring up Kira Jagodzinski and Felicia Maselli. Uh, Kira is a coordinator for the Illinois Harm Reduction and Recovery Coalition, and she's also a co-writer and lead advocate for Louis's Law. Uh, Felicia Maselli, uh, whose son Louis is the namesake of the law, uh, is a founder of the LTM Foundation, as well as a recovery coach at Serenity House. Uh, she also runs our grief and loss groups, as well as uh, parental support and smart recovery meetings. Uh, and in addition, she, Felicia is a great friend of mine. She was the, um, the second person really brought on full time when the Ross started. And it was just her and I in a tiny office. And now it's still a tiny office, but there's just a bunch more people in it. Uh, so she's very near and dear to my heart. So they're, they're here to talk about the creation of Louis Law. Uh, as well as to kind of maybe give a rundown on some of these other substance use and mental health uh, legislative work in Illinois. Um, I do want to leave some time at the end for questions or comments. Uh, so, Danny, if you want to throw up that screen share of the presentation, I'm going to go ahead and welcome uh, Kira and Felicia. So come on up. So I'm going to move. Y'all are going to take this and you can talk right into those mics. Can I tilt it? Yeah. Okay. Do whatever you need. Hi, guys. Can you hear us? Okay. So. Danny, you should... got the presentation. There we go. Great. Okay. Just a little about me, really fast. Um, I know. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I was mainly brought on in my role in. Also, I want to acknowledge everyone in the actual room. <laughs> um, I was brought on to work for IHRRC, the Harm Reduction Recovery Coalition, and also to work on Louis Law because I'm currently 17. I graduated high school early, and that's why I have the avail availability to, to do all of this. Um, previously, I spent the last two years working in a state senator's office where I wrote and passed another piece of legislation. And I also worked on a few um, statewide political campaigns. So first, just quickly, <laughs> when I introduce her now, most 17 year olds are breaking laws. This young lady's writing them. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. So I also want to preface this by, I'm most familiar with Louis Law. I wrote the language for it. Um, IHRC has a legislative platform that we are supporting for other pieces of legislation that I will touch briefly on after this presentation. But I think next. we're ready to move to the next, next slide. <laughs> next thing. And we can go to the next slide. Thanks. So, oh, Felicia. Yeah, I, I think most of you have probably seen a, a picture of my son. That was when he was 18. Um, and he'd probably be mad at me that I picked that picture because he didn't like it. But it just, I, I like that to show that picture because he, you know, it represents just a, a normal everyday young man in, you know, in the middle of a, 
uh, high school. So I, I like that picture of him, but I know he wouldn't. But that's that's my beautiful boy, Louie. Next. <laughs> okay, so uh, nearly 60% of teens have used drugs in the past month. That's according to the latest SAMHSA data. Um, that's not, not including caffeine, so alcohol, marijuana, illicit <laughs> drugs. Um, that's also in the United States, not statewide. Next. <laughs> okay. okay, so can do you think yeah. you're... Thank yeah, you. so... You can talk to you. The, the, we all can agree there is a drug crisis. So over the last few decades... Educational institutions have attempted to prevent youth drugs use through abstinence-only scare tactics that promote harmful punitive responses to drug use or extremely limited, outdated information. We all know it's failed. Um, it just personally, I mean, my son won the Dare Award um, for Springfield, and I thought we were we were going to have smooth sailing because he was properly educated. Um, yeah, I wish that it work and we wouldn't ha still have to, you know, change or update or improve, but it, it, it's failing. So youth experimentation with drugs is widespread. It's shared, it's a shared experience among youth. The hardest hit populations, especially marginalized communities of color, need Illinois more than anything to embrace and compassionately <laughs> inform youth about drugs the consequences and the way to stay safe. And, and the youth want and deserve to have a comprehensive drug education. Um, and parents and caregivers deserve the tools and strategies to protect their own ch children. I wanna speak on this really fast, sorry, Danny. <laughs> um, I know it's kind of, I, I just, it's not usual that you have a teenager working on legislation that's affecting teens or um, most initiatives, but, I, I have a twin brother. Um, we had the same health classes. And by the same, I mean, we were in the same class at the same time. Um, in middle school, we were taught DARE. And then once we got to high school, I had a um, expedited project on drugs where I researched different celebrities that had different addictions. That was what I learned. That was my entire high school education on drugs. Um, that was my freshman year. and. Over time, I saw my friends starting to experiment. I saw my brother starting to experiment. My parents weren't given information. They weren't given resources to try and speak to us about this. And because the school wasn't and my parents weren't, we didn't receive anything. We had access to the internet and most kids aren't going to look up why drugs are bad. They're going to look up where to find them or what, what positive effects they can be used for. And now, especially, teens are able to purchase drugs online. They're able to contact dealers. They don't need to know them. It can be delivered to their house, no contact in person. And especially with the fentanyl and now xylazine crisis, um, it's really important that we're giving teens actual, true information about drugs and not just asking them not to, because that's never worked. And we deserve to keep them. We, we just, teens doesn't we as in me. Um, <laughs> we deserve a comprehensive education. Okay, next slide now. Thank you. And I, I briefly touched on fentanyl and xylazine, and I'm sure you guys are pretty yeah, knowledgeable yeah. on it. So yeah, I think, I think we, we can did. skip it. Yeah. Well, wait, talk about xylazine. Go back. Oh, sorry. That, that's still relatively new as far yeah. as learning about it. So xylazine is a tranquil tranquilizer mm -hmm. used by veterinarians. It's starting to see a lot of... Um, spike on the east coast and in a few months it'll be here in pretty large droves um it's already here it's but typically it's what, what we see in the east coast comes here later and it it is it's an animal tranquil tranquilizer and the side effects of it are are devastating and actually we're afraid for what's going to happen when it hits harder here um, I also want to specify fentanyl overdoses are reversible in, in some cases, and we can also test for them. We have no tests for xylazine, and if someone overdoses from xylazine, there's that that's it. We have no information on it, aside from that it's moving. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 
Okay, so again, we touched on this. I'm sure most of you are familiar with DARE. Either you went through DARE or your, your children probably did. Um, it stops at refusal skills, which is important. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't work. We need more information. It's one step of preventing drug use, of, of keeping our kids and our community safe. And we need to expand it. Next slide, please. Thank you. So Louis Law is taken from the State Overdose Action Plan. It's a governor's appointed um, group of subject matter experts who created multiple different um, like ideas that could help solve and end the opioid overdose um, epidemic in our state. And um, priority eight is increasing education and giving facts to, to students. And so this is primarily based off of that plan. Next slide. Thank you. And again, we all know youth are influenced by their peers, their friends, their siblings. Um, we see it online in TV shows. I know not all of us are happy about that, but it's it's everywhere. Um, and also the state, the overdose action plan acknowledges uh, with the exact data in there. And if anyone's interested, I can send you the, the link to it. Um, but teens and youth that use um, like non-medical use of prescription opioids and heroin have poor school adjustment, worse in mental health, and high rates of polysubstance use, which is not the most surprising fact, but we do have data now for our state that proves that true. Next slide. Thank you. So Louis Law is an expansion to the current state guidelines, um, the current state standards. So we're in collaboration with ISB right now. We're waiting to make amendments once the bill is filed with their recommendations. We are also in contact with IFT, or the Illinois Federation of Teachers and the Illinois Education Association, IEA, which are the two main um, teachers unions. And we're also talking with uh, the Dep Department of Public Health, Department of Child and Family Services. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but Essentially, what, what this aims to accomplish is to not change the standards actually in law, because that's not in ISV's jurisdiction, but we want to provide resources for schools and for parents. So this would, it's, it, it's not a mandate for teachers is what I'm saying. It's a mandate for ISB to provide resources for teachers. If you go on the State Board of Education's website right now, you can find certain resources for teachers to use, even if it's not required, which is incredibly helpful, but there is nothing regarding drug education. For the last, um, I think, 40 years, schools have been sent DARE, and that's it. And so even though DARE is not recommended, it's either they use DARE, they use nothing, and they try and figure out how to teach the eight standards that mention drug use in the entire um, law, in Illinois law. So this would ensure that ISB uh, communicates with a few other departments and the, op the Opioid um, Government Council to create this plan, distribute it to schools, and have it available on the website. And you can go to the next slide, but we also don't have funding for this. There's nothing in the budget set aside for this specifically, but the um, Overdose Opioid Advisory Council has, I'm sure you guys probably know, the opioid remediation funds. It's, I think, like $2 billion, and they expect around $200 million of it to go towards prevention, which hopefully, if this passes, will go towards um, helping schools put this into place if they choose to do so. So I answered the first question already. It's not a mandate for educators. It's a mandate for this Board of Education. If we if we ask for a mandate, a mandate it, it would not pass because we do know our teachers work really hard and they're, and they're overloaded. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's not a mandate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with harm reduction, but I'm sure you are. Oh, yeah. uh, it does not condone or endorse drug use. It provides resources for people that do already choose to use drugs with safer routes to do so. And 
in Louis Law, we are teaching high schoolers, um, likely junior and seniors, about harm reduction. That's not something that's taught, but it's something that needs to be, in my opinion, and in most of this opinion. When we are talking to legislators, we expected our biggest pushback to be about harm reduction, and we haven't received a single comment on it so far. I, I thought for sure that they were going to be like, you know, we can't we can't teach our high schools about um, fentanyl strips and Narcan and the Big Samaritan Law because we don't want our kids you know, to learn any of those. But um, honestly, I was really surprised that they were like kind of reality based. Like we, I guess we we have to approach this a different way, which was so refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've touched on D.A.R.E. a few times, but the first time that at least I can find that it was deemed ineffective by a peer reviewed study was in 2003. And I was born in 2005, so clearly there has been no <laughs> update since then. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And then I can send this information out to people if you're interested. Would you mind if I put my email on the chat? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. While you're doing that. While, while, yeah, while she's doing that, I mean, I was going to go into depth about oh, Louis Law, but we'll just put it in the, in the chat. Please, you can go. You can go. Um, but the, the drug education and youth overdose and overdose prevention um, law, which I like Louis law better, and it's a lot easier to say, would just, um, you know, it's, it would, it's gonna be age appropriate and culturally competent um, because different things are going on in different communities, believe it or not. Some, some areas um, use one, certain kind of drug and, and it's regional compared to another one. So we want the community's um, input on that. We want to make sure that we're hitting everybody in Illinois, um, rural areas that, you know, they don't have a lot of resources or they don't have a lot of information. We're making sure that we're going to include the whole state of Illinois. Um, and then, you know, with the risk, risk factors, like she said, if we know 60% of uh, high schoolers are experimenting and we we teach them like I, um you know just say no and or just say no we know that's not working so do know the the risk of fentanyl what a uh, fentanyl's in in cocaine fentanyl is in um benzos fentanyl is in, even in uh, weed right now so we need to teach them that kind of harm reduction also and of course we would love to you know every if everyone in high school would be abstinent and be afraid to do any kind of drug because we're also going to teach them that if you wait until your brain's finished forming you have a 70 percent less risk to develop a substance use disorder i mean i think that's really important information but are they going to listen maybe some um but we need to be reality based and and i love the fact that like teachers and parents and communities um, are going to have resources at, at hands with Louis Law because we know that the overdose rate is just going up. It's fentanyl driven right now and maybe xylazine on, on the rise. And can we afford to like not educate our kids anymore while that rate still is going up and up and up? It's alarming. It's alarming. So I mean, I, I think if you guys could share what what we're learning about the data, if you look up Louis Law, we also have an advocacy training. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Give me, okay. yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, just about what Felicia said, uh, the CDC, I think six, six months ago now, um, we put out a report that 16 through 23 year olds, I believe is the fastest growing age group for overdoses. So this is, in my opinion, a great time to do it. If, I mean, ideally it would have been done quite, quite a while ago, but it's especially important now. Um, I'll touch on the act training okay. in a second. I have four, or the Illinois Harm Reduction Recovery Coalition um, has four other pieces of legislation that we're supporting currently. We are doing research um, about what bills we could support further than, than this, but there are I think 2000, over 2000 bills in the house alone. So it's quite a bit to go through, um, but 
I am not as knowledgeable on the other four because I wrote this and I didn't write the others, but I can answer any questions you have. So the first one is overdose prevention sites pilot. Um, overdose, overdose prevention sites are safe, um, clean locations for people to use drugs that they have going into it. It's monitored by healthcare professionals. New York is the only city in the United States that has this. Um, and there are other countries like Switzerland and I believe um, Portugal have these as well. And I mean, they're throughout, but but Switzerland and Portugal especially have them um, in, in mass numbers. And it is- uh, they, In New York alone, um, in one year, they saved over 876 lives. Um, they cleaned up, um, I forgot how many like millions million of needles, needles. Up, up the ground. Um, They've uh, practically closed down their open air heroin um, sites. They, they practically closed those down. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't know the number, but countless, countless amounts of people into other overdose, um, other resources. So we know that like people are going to be like, oh, you're, you're, you know, helping people use drugs, but it's a means to an end. Um, and we also know that like when someone calls for an overdose from an EMT, the average cost is 25 to 30,000. Um, this ultimately, and, and this is how we're gonna like try and reach people that say that this is, you know, helping people do drugs or, or um, this is the appeal that ultimately we're gonna be saving so much money on those overdose calls that this is actually gonna save us a lot of money. Thank you. So currently, OPS sites, overdose prevention sites, are illegal in all states. Um, it, it's illegal in Illinois. And so this bill would create a system for nonprofits to apply for a license to start an OPS site or an, an overdose prevention site. And it would be, it's a Chicago based pilot. So until another piece of legislation expands this, it will only allow. OPS to be in Chicago, probably on the south and west side, or primarily. Um, and yeah. yeah, if you have any questions, I think we have time for that. Yeah. Great. So I have the other ones written on my hand in case I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one sec. <laughs> okay, so the <laughs> Okay, so another one is um, it's, oh, and that's already filed. Louis Law is, is in the process of being filed, so we don't have a bill number for it yet. We expect that to be in about two weeks, mm -hmm. and then it'll be assigned to committee. Um, the OPS is already a, a bill. You can look up HB002 in ILGA. Um, another one that we're supporting is, it, it ex I don't know the name of all of them, um, but when a pregnant person gives birth, if either they or their infant tests positive for drugs in their system, the child is immediately given to DCFS. So the problem with that is there's no actual process for them to go through to determine if the child would be safer in, in protective services or with the parent and the parent is going through recovery. We're not saying that a child is better in one place or the other. We are asking the Department of Child and Family Services to create a system to determine where they would be safest and where they would where they would be best. Another one is um, oh, currently any amount of illicit drugs is a felony, and there's a there's a piece of legislation right now in the Senate where a sugar packet's worth of illicit drugs, a, a personal amount that's not going to be sold can, will, will be changed from a felony to a class A misdemeanor. The importance of this is A, getting felonies off of people's records that affects their ability to get housing, their ability to apply for loans, their ability to get jobs. And it's important that they're not immediately put in the system for it, but they're connected to resources. And this bill would not only change that, but it would expunge all previous records, of, all previous felonies in Illinois, um, that are personal amounts, which again, like a Steva packet. So not like, like this much. <laughs> um, 
do they have to go to treatment or would it be yes. resources to go? They would get resources to go. They would have to yeah. But it would it would be a class A misdemeanor, so it's just one step below a felony. <laughs> and then the last one is, and forgive me, um, I'm not as knowledgeable on this one, but it legalizes use of like LSD, um, natural resources, mushrooms, um, and it creates a system for people over the age of 18 to use these natural drugs as Healthcare, while being monitored by a healthcare professional, because they're finding uh, out a lot that for PTSD and uh, and um, yeah. trauma-based people that that is really helpful, um, and and data showing that it you know it is positively affecting people with with those disorders. Um, so it's more it's more for to allow it to be. Uh, explored mm -hmm. for health benefits yeah so i think i'm ready for any questions if you guys have them if you ask a question and i don't know it's very likely i will email you with an answer i promise <laughs> All right. I will talk to people for it. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to open it up first before I kind of throw it to everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for presenting. That was, that was awesome. I've obviously, okay. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of privy to Louis laws. It's been coming up because obviously I work in the same office as Felicia and we've talked to, you know, Chelsea and we've kind of gotten, um, you know, a feel for what it's going to look like. Uh, but I think it's really important. I'm, I'm someone who's gone into public schools and done presentations. Um, and I, I, I have to say the first time before I went into a school to kind of give a lived experience presentation, um, I was kind of nervous because I remember what it was like for me in high school and having to sit in health class and hear like a dare type program. Uh, but I was really surprised. The kids were actually very engaged. Um, they were kind of eager to hear a more realistic approach to, to what we were talking about with recovery. And uh, they would stay after class and they would come up and ask questions. And it was like, you know, it really kind of opened my eyes to like, there's a, a real need for this type of education um, statewide you know, and just have that realistic approach, the realistic kind of pragmatic approach of people are going to use, let's just make sure they're informed on what it is you're using, harm reduction, you know, all those types of things. So I'm, I'm really excited and I hope this gets off the ground. Um, so that's, that's number one. Um, number two, you had mentioned the very last one, which you don't know a ton about the uh, psychedelics one. Yeah. So I just wanted to shamelessly promote something. Uh, in April, and I'll put the date up uh, before we leave, uh, Bruce Seawick, who is formerly of uh, Leiden Family Services and now College of DuPage, is going to present uh, for us on that. So psychedelics in the use of uh, trauma-informed care. Um, he does these presentations. It's phenomenal. I was able to see it, uh, his presentation for Schomburg Library last month, and he's going to come and do that one for us in April. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely come check it out because Bruce is great and it's a really uh, pertinent topic. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to open it up. So if anybody here has a question, you can come up or I can go out into the crowd like the Jerry Springer show. Um, uh. Or if you're online, um, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question for either Kira or Felicia. I'm going to comment really fast just on what you said. Um, Again, I probably cannot answer that many questions on the last one, but it is HB001. It's probably the easiest bill number that there is. Um, <laughs> it's in legal terms on ILGA, which is not the easiest for most people to understand. Um, but before this presentation and um, probably in more detail than I can give you in more accurate detail, if you want to look into it further, it's available there, HB001. Does anybody here have any questions before I throw it to the online folks? Murph, I'll come out to you. Hang on. Yeah, you mentioned about the ineffectiveness of recovery for the xylazine. Is Narcan not effective for that? No, Holy Narcan does not cow. work for the xylazine. That's There's scary. nothing that works for xylazine, at wow. least right now. Is that, I just heard recently on the news that there was one that they didn't even know what it was. Is that the xylazine? Um. Probably not. They can't determine. Oh, no. Yeah. Xylazine cannot be um, determined on any drug tests. Oh, that's the so, one then. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sorry. It's scary. We can't oh, test yeah. for it, but a coroner, you know. Yeah. yeah. A coroner can identify it, but if someone wants to test their drugs for xylazine, they cannot identify it. 
Thanks, Murph. Anybody else in person? Can you discuss the uh, Portugal uh, results and how that worked? Yeah. So in case I couldn't hear online, uh, we were asking about the results of Portugal safe consumption sites and how that may affect some of the things that we do with ours here. Mm -hmm. So I know more about Switzerland, but they're they're pretty much the same data. Both have around, I think, 20, I'm not going to say 20,000, like 20 million um, citizens. And roughly, they had uh, Switzerland had around 128 overdose death overdose deaths so um it's pretty effective if i i can find more data for you that's the one that i know off the top of my head i know um portugal has reduced their overdose deaths by more than half Yes. So there's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be filled with resources and manned by the um I forgot who the Illinois Human Services Department um that's who mans the one in New York um and yes there's gonna be you know clean using food coats I mean clothes whatever there there can they can give but also a list of resources. And they're always gonna say like, would you like to get help? Um, and, and, and if a person says no, um, that's fine too, meeting them where they're at, but treating someone with dignity and respect and making sure they're safe is always appreciated instead of punishing them. We know that doesn't work. There is a question in the back of it. But So the question here for people online was, is there going to be uh, like a law enforcement presence at the consumption sites? Actually, um, Jared and I explored that a little and, and no. And actually the police actually in New York bring people. They work together. Um, they actually bring people to those to, to those sites. Um, so no, I and, and you know I'm sure if I was a user I'd be worried about that also, but you know um, no, they know that that's not going to actually help and they're they're a little busy, so that's a good I mean that's actually a good thing that they're working hand in hand, with with New York. If anyone's interested, if you you can on YouTube, uh, Vice News did a piece on the safe consumption sites in New York. Actually, a few different outlets did, but they specifically mentioned that it's kind of like a no-go zone for police. Like they don't let them in. Um, there's no arrests on the site, you know, unless something violent breaks out. Even then, they try to defuse things. Um, and it's really they really do lean into the the resources angle. It's not just about you know, obviously they want a safe consumption space for people, but they really do lean into the resources part. And, uh, you know, no one's uh, died of an overdose in the New York one, you know, and there's been multiple overdoses, but, you know, no deaths. So pragmatically, it's, it's, it's really, you know, if people are going to use, let's start looking at how we're going to keep them safe while they do it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Okay. And you guys are not worried about any drug dealers coming up because, like, if I was, I mean, I would say if I was a dealer, that's what I would call. So the question, the question was, do we was there, or is there worries about maybe having uh, drugs being sold on site and things like that? Um, you I, know, I I have to think the bottom line is saving a life. So I think you know we just need to concentrate on that, and I don't really know. I'm I'm sure there's always going to be drug deals going on. Um, but we get to highlight the saving all those lives. I, I think that's what we got to concentrate on. So I want to turn it to the folks on the Zoom here. I see one hand up. Slay, you got a question? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about whether there's Narcan trained professionals or other professionals on site. Should there be an instance where there's overdoses or things like that? Come up. So the staff are all medically trained. They're medical professionals. Um, they might have security that may or may not know how to use Narcan, but I'm assuming that if they're there, they will quickly figure out how to use Narcan. Um, the, the idea of OPS is it's a form of harm reduction. So harm reduction is keeping people alive long enough to get them into recovery. 
this is another way to ensure that people stay safe until they are ready on their own terms to to go into recovery. Um, I, again, they are highly encouraged to seek treatment, but it's not a requirement to use the site. Thank you. Everyone there is going to be trained on Narcan. Everyone that works there, and then they also leave with it. Perfect. Thank you. Anybody else on Zoom got a question for the two ladies? All right. So where can they find out more information if they want to? Great question. So the Illinois Harm Reduction and Recovery Coalition has a website where we have advocacy toolkits that has um, locations. It, it has all of the information for the legislation that we're supporting, or at least the, the information that we have. So we have a website for, or we have part of it. I'll see the website in a second. Yeah. Um, we have the bill number, we have the language, we have a fact sheet, we have an FAQ sheet, we have data that supports us, we have like studies, um, any news sources, we have videos, um, email templates that people can use to send out to legislators. Every single piece of material that we have that supports this legislation, if an advocate or a person wants to learn more about why this is why why we're doing this, they can find it there. So I will put it in the chat as I say it out loud. It's IllinoisHarmReduction.org. And also you can just, you can search up Illinois Harm Reduction and Recovery Coalition. I know it's kind of long. Um, so I don't know why I said just, but. <laughs> Felicia, any other uh, things on the end here? Well, I, I just would say like the time to act is now. Um, there's power. There's power in actually um, calling your legislator. There's power in, in saving all these lives. Um, and I, I just don't think we can afford to wait anymore. Um, I, I think we have to do this now because I, those, those numbers are so alarming and they keep climbing. So, but, you know, let's all work together and, and, ch and change it and save some lives. Go ahead. Um, and not to promote more stuff, but mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> um, IHRC has recently developed ACT trainings, which are advocacy champion trainings. So if this legislation or specific ones are interest to you, we it's 6.30 to 7.30 every single Monday for the next like three months. And if we need longer, um, Felicia and other moms primarily that that lost children to overdose helped us develop the program and they're also the people leading it i will be on all of those calls as well um it's a it's a place to learn more about how you can move forward to support our our legislation that ihrc is or our legislative platform i should say um and you learn more about the problem even though you guys are all subject matter experts um, <laughs> and then learn what you can do to move forward also might be a stretch, but if any of you guys are interested and really passionate passionate about OPS, we are currently encouraging and coordinating advocates and different organizations to go down to Springfield to advocate on behalf of OPS. Um, we have people down there that are leading the effort. So if you're an individual that wants to go and you're not sure about how to speak to people, that's fine. Every single week that's we that session is in session. Uh, we have people down there that are leading and teaching how to talk to legislators about OPS. Uh, the reason we're doing OPS and not any of the other bills that we talked about is because OPS is probably the more difficult to explain and to convince people to vote for. Uh, Louis' law also is kind of expected to pass. Um, we're getting bipartisan support on it. And honestly, yeah, in sponsorship. And once we have ISB's um, cooperation and, and their amendments, it's it shouldn't be that that hard of a sell. Um, but OPS has it went through the 102nd General Assembly. Currently, we're in the 103rd, so it was there for two years already, and that was when it was just statewide. This is a Chicago-based pilot, so hopefully we'll have better luck. But if you're interested, my email's already in the chat, and you can contact me, and we can talk about it further later. <laughs> We're also going to, um, Rask is going to um, host a town hall about Louis' Law here. It's going to be at six o'clock on March 9th at the big hall here. So if you have any questions that come up after this, that would be a great time to share them. All right, everybody give it a, give, give a round of applause for these two. It was phenomenal. Do you have one more thing? 
Thank I was you. just gonna say who. Oh, there's another question. Really fast. Oh, there's. Oh, okay. Oh, those are clapping hands. Oh. <laughs> oh, I was so worried. I was like, what did we say? <laughs> um, really fast. The people in the town halls, um, at least who we hope to have there. We want to have a superintendent. We want to have law enforcement. Felicia is going to be there. We have a college student that has lived experience there. Um, other people that I can't remember. Representatives of every yeah. kind of yeah. person uh, um, involved in this. Legislators. Chelsea Laliberte Barnes will be there, who's helping Felicia and I on this. And I'll be there, but I won't be on the panel. But that's where you can ask people about like how it would affect specific people that are involved in this process. So yeah, thank you. All right, thank you again. Okay, this is the last one and I got just Just think about the youth of America and like what great young, beautiful people are, are actually doing things. It gives me faith. I just wanna say thank you. All right, thank you again to both of you. You're welcome. We're all gonna be working for you someday. I guarantee it. All right. So we are got about eight minutes left. So what I wanna do is, cause there's a couple more things to get through. Uh, this is usually the time where we open it up for like organizational or personal updates. So mm -hmm. if there's anything anybody's working on, and this goes for in house here or on Zoom that you would like to promote, or if anybody is working on a project where there might be some needs or barriers you're facing, uh, I'm going to open it up to the floor here for a couple minutes. So has anybody got anything? And I say this every month, you all have something. I know you do. You can't pretend like we're not. Wow, really? Oh, I got one. Come on up. Yeah. I'm going to pass the mic. You get a microphone. Do you want to take a seat too? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous public speaking. Don't be, so. don't be nervous. You're great. Um, hello. So my name is Sandra. I'm from a bridge back. And our exciting news was that we were from November till about February. We were on an administrative hold. And we just opened back up February 1st. So we do virtual, um, we, we do telehealth for everything, IOP, OP. Um, we have a sober living site and we're hoping by the summertime to expand our PHP program. So if anybody needs anything like that, we're located in Arlington Heights. And that's a bridge back. What's the website? Uh, a bridge back. A bridge back.com. Cool, I'll put that in the chat too. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, awesome. Thank All right, anybody else? All right. So if, the, if anyone does have anything, we can jump on after I share this last bit of exciting business with everyone. Hang on one second here. So this is upcoming projects. So there are two very exciting projects that are coming up actually in partnership with the DuPage Health Department. So I'm going to kind of talk about the two of them and then uh, where we might need some help from people with. Uh, first one is focus groups. So we are partnering with DuPage Health Department to have a series of focus groups. So um, we're looking to do three focus groups uh, of about six to eight people in each group. So um, two in-person groups and one virtual. So the in-person are going to be here at Serenity House and the virtual one will obviously be over Zoom. So why are we doing these focus groups? So we want to have kind of deeper in-depth conversations around uh, folks' experiences, maybe some of the barriers they face in accessing services out here, um, and then just kind of, you know, dig a little bit deeper than maybe we did in our initial community assessment or in other community assessments that are out there. Um, so they're just going to be conversations, and we're going to hopefully get some interesting info out of those. Uh, so some of that data we're going to collect will be used to, to direct some of the focus of these programs and, and really look for what the gaps might be, and then how we can kind of work together to, to maybe plug some of those gaps. Uh, there will be a gift card and food for participation. Um, right now we are uh, settling on the dates which are coming up soon. It'll be in the next month or so. Uh, but if anyone's interested, my email is up there. Let me know. And if it's not you, if you maybe you're working for a, a program that uh, you know works with people in recovery, um, we're, we're, we'd love to kind of extend our reach for who we're getting to come in and do those. So we're really excited about that one. Um, number two, if anyone has been here from the very beginning when we started ROSC or just knows me in general, you'll know that I've been uh, uh, evangelizing for Narcan boxes in DuPage County since almost like day one. It's finally happening. So we are getting some uh, funding from the DuPage County Health Department uh, for the um, 
the implementation of kind of anonymous takeaway boxes and numerous spots in DuPage. So where we're at right now is uh, we're in the location phase. So we're looking for places that could be maybe outside of an organization, that could be at a private business, that could be kind of anywhere in DuPage. The main thing we're looking at is uh, kind of maybe looking at where there might be some hot spots in DuPage County, maybe for overdoses or for you know substance use related crimes. But uh, we're also looking geographically to make sure we got this stuff spread out. And we're not just clustering them in, in one particular area. Um, so these could be indoor or possibly outdoor, depending on the need. Um, the installation and the maintenance part be completely taken care of by ROSC. So this is a win-win for the sites. Um, you know, they will also be directed back to resources. We're going to have QR codes and links uh, up on these boxes so people can access resources easier. Uh, and this is the important part, no cost to the site. There's no cost. Just let us know if you want a site to have a Narcan box and we'll talk to you about it because we are we are coming up on that in the next year. So I, I really couldn't be happier about that. Salia, I see your hand up. Yeah, just 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 curious about how the temp control is going to work with these boxes, considering that they could be outside and you know temps drastically yes. change overnight. Um, Absolutely. So we thought about that too. We really got to take a look at the funding and how we can spread that out. So there are temperature controlled boxes. They are mm -hmm. a little bit more on the expensive side, but they they are available. So we really want to look at the need, right? So can we do maybe you know five indoor boxes versus two mm -hmm. outdoor boxes and really yeah. try to think pragmatically is how how we have it spread now this is not going to preclude um any other uh future narcan funding that we're looking at because we're also mm -hmm. looking at some grant funding um to put in maybe some more vending machines and things like that into the county but you're right um we when we're, if we're thinking outdoors we do have to think about the temperature the, the Goldilocks zone that it's supposed to stay in. But yeah, the, we're, we're going to kind of work that stuff out still. Any other questions about either of these two things, Scott? Yes. Scott from the DuPage Health Department series, you can come up and talk for a second. That's a, a really good point. Uh, I, I just want to mention uh, with regards to temperature, something that we've been uh, talking with uh, Adapt Pharma about is the fact that there is a little bit more tolerance um, at least as far as the, the Narcan itself, itself staying useful, uh, it, in periods of cold weather. So we have never like left our Narcan uh, in freezing temperatures or anything like that, but there are times that we are mailing out Narcan where uh, temperatures outside are freezing and they have notified us that as long as the Narcan itself was brought back into, uh, thawed and brought back into, uh, room temperature, it would still be useful at the same efficacy as it was before. Yeah. Now, it isn't only cold temperatures that you have to worry about when it steps outside, but I, 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 all of that is to say that there are a lot of things to figure out on that end, but we are trying to kind of push the limits of what temperatures are acceptable, both on the high and the low end. And so far, at least some preliminary good information on uh, low temperature uh acceptance i, I don't really yeah, yeah. excellent thanks scott yeah. appreciate it all right uh we got about a minute left so I, I got all the info on my end out uh does anybody have anything else they want to add here at the end anybody in person well listen i appreciate everybody's uh, participation today uh really great presentation from kira and felicia uh if you'd like to watch this again it's going to go up on our youtube page i usually have that up by the end of the week and then I'm going to follow up uh, with emails with all of this information we talked about today. So not only the legislation, but these upcoming projects that we're working on. So again, our next meeting is uh, on March 8th uh, and Naomi's house will be presenting. So make sure you come out to that. And other than that, everybody have a wonderful rest of your week and we'll see you next month. And I'm going to hang out for just a minute in case anybody needs anything. <laughs>